Starship's next launch is almost here, and SpaceX just nailed the final hurdle, a flawless, full-duration static fire of Ship 35. But just days earlier, that same ship stumbled with engine flashes and an early shutdown during a similar test. So let's recap what went wrong, break down the fixes SpaceX made, and see how they turned failure into success. During the first round on May 1st, the vehicle underwent a 30-second static fire to validate design upgrades introduced after the Flight 8 failure in March. While the engines initially behaved as expected, bright flashes near the aft section appeared toward the end of the test, accompanied by an early shutdown of the vacuum engines, roughly five seconds before the sea level engines. These anomalies likely resulted from abrupt engine cutoffs, known as hard stops, that can trigger hot gas leaks, seal failures, or the ignition of trapped propellant in the engine bay due to thermal or pressure transients. Following the incident, Ship 35 was returned to the production site for inspection, where at least one of the Raptor vacuum engines was reportedly replaced. After resolving all issues and completing system checks, the ship was sent back to Massey's for the second round of testing on Saturday afternoon. Ship 35 successfully completed a full-duration static fire on Monday morning, running all six Raptor engines for a full 60 seconds. This test was critical, not just to validate the performance of the vehicle and the engines before flight, but also to confirm the effectiveness of the fixes SpaceX implemented following the failures of Flight 7 and 8, as well as the engine anomaly observed during the May 1st static fire. All engines ignited and remained stable throughout the burn. Around 52 seconds into the test, a brief flash was observed beneath the vehicle, visually similar to the engine flameout seen on May 1st. But this time, all engines continued firing without interruption until the full-duration cutoff. That suggests the event was either non-critical or effectively handled by onboard systems without impacting the burn sequence. With the static fire now complete, Ship 35 is expected to roll back to the production site for detailed post-test inspections and final flight preparations ahead of Starship's ninth launch. Meanwhile, Ship 35's flight partner, Booster 14, is undergoing final launch preparations inside Megabay 1 with system inspections, software updates, and checks on avionics, hydraulics, and engines. The rollout of both the ship and booster to the launch site, followed by the full stack assembly for launch, is expected in the coming days. Prior to the static fire anomaly, SpaceX had been targeting May 9th for Flight 9, as indicated by navigation warnings for both the Starbase launch area and the Indian Ocean splashdown zone. However, the latest updates suggest a revised launch window now targeting as early as May 21st. That said, SpaceX still needs to secure an FAA launch license, which will only be granted once the FAA confirms that SpaceX has identified the root cause of the Flight 8 anomaly and implemented the necessary fixes. As always, the license is expected to be issued just a few days before launch, so unless it's granted by May 18th, we could see the launch date pushed back further. Shifting the focus to the second launch pad, significant progress has been made at the site in the past week alone. Following detailed assembly procedures, precise prefitting of critical components such as booster holddown clamps, and thorough final inspections, the orbital launch mount for Pad B was carefully rolled out to the launch site on Tuesday night. The move was escorted by support teams to ensure structural stability, monitor clearances, and assess ground conditions throughout the journey. After arriving at the launch site, teams began preparing the launch mount for installation. This included rigging the cranes to the mount's hold-down clamp attachment points for lift, as shown in this figure. By Monday morning, the mount was carefully hoisted and aligned over the flame trench, then lowered onto a set of pre-installed support legs anchored around the trench. This completed the main stacking procedure. Right now, teams are focused on securing the mount to the pad infrastructure. This involves mechanically fastening the mount to the support legs, connecting structural reinforcement points, and beginning the integration of power, fluid, and data lines required for launch operations. One essential phase involves linking the launch mount to the water deluge network. This system channels pressurized water from storage reservoirs to the launch pad via an already installed underground piping grid. Water manifolds pre-attached to the mount will evenly disperse the flow across the grooves on the top surface. At the moment of engine ignition, this water is released to shield the mount from extreme thermal and acoustic effects. The new square-shaped launch mount at Pad B includes several design upgrades over the original mount at Pad A. These improvements are based on insights gained from repeated Starship launches and booster static fires. By analyzing how the pad is structure withstood mechanical loads, thermal stress, and vibration over time, SpaceX engineers have refined the Pad B mount for greater reliability, durability, and ease of maintenance. Let's take a closer look at these changes. 
A notable aspect of PAD BOLM is the potential for a removable or modular design, unlike the fixed structure at PAD A, though specific details are sparse. One strong clue is the visible bolt hole pattern on the mount's legs, hinting that the structure is meant to be detachable and interchangeable. This has major implications for turnaround time. At pad A, post-launch recovery often means cutting and re-welding steel, fixing damaged plumbing, and running detailed inspections, work that can take weeks. In contrast, the bolted interface at pad B allows the entire launch mount to be swapped out quickly, moving most of the repair work off-site and clearing the pad for the next mission without delay. This modular setup is key to SpaceX's high cadence goals. To achieve multiple launches per month and eventually multiple Starship flights per day, they need to separate ground servicing from pad operations. With removable mounts, they can roll in a fresh unit while the used mount goes to a refurbishment facility. That turns maintenance into a parallel process, not a bottleneck. This setup not only enables fast reuse, but also simplifies future upgrades, making it easier to upgrade the launch mount hardware and integrate design improvements without tearing apart the pad infrastructure. Of course, there are trade-offs. Bolted joints need precise torque control and are vulnerable to issues like preload loss, loosening from vibration, and fatigue around flange edges. Every joint becomes a potential failure point and demands regular checks. Still, the advantages, quick turnaround, off-site servicing, and modular upgrades will outweigh these risks. Both Pad A and Pad B launch mounts feature 20 hold down clamps to secure the super heavy booster during static fire tests and launches. However, there's a noticeable design shift with the clamps on Pad B compared to those on Pad A. The Pad A clamps are bulkier, more complex, and have numerous moving parts. In contrast, Pad B's clamps are simpler and more streamlined. Rather than gripping the booster's aft skirt from below like at Pad A, the new clamps on Pad B lock into dedicated slots on the booster's aft section. This modification significantly speeds up the clamp and release process, improving both efficiency and reliability. With fewer moving parts, the risk of mechanical failure is reduced, which adds a layer of operational safety. The new clamps are designed with advanced materials and high-strength fasteners to ensure durability, with the capacity to handle the increased weight and structural demands of future Starship variants, which will be taller, hold more propellant, and carry larger payloads. Interestingly, the new mount no longer includes the 20 outer booster quick disconnects. These QDs previously supplied high pressure helium and nitrogen to spin up the outer 20 Raptor engines' turbo pumps before ignition. Those gases will now likely be routed through the main quick disconnect system, consolidating functions that were previously separated. The main QD system, responsible for delivering propellant, gases, and electrical power to the booster before liftoff, has also undergone significant design upgrades compared to Pad A. Pad B introduces a dual QD architecture, as indicated by markings on the launch mount that suggest the location and spacing of this new setup. Future Super Heavy Boosters, particularly the Block 2 variants, will be equipped with two QD panels to connect with this updated design. This dual configuration enables faster and more balanced propellant loading, reduces the risk of overloading individual lines, and introduces redundancy. Near the launch mount, the booster QD gantry structure is actively being outfitted with vital hardware, including electrical and hydraulic systems, control valves, and fluid manifolds. These components will support the operation of the dual QD mechanisms once they're installed. Beneath the launch mount sits the flame diverter, which recently saw some work completed. The pipes that supply water to the diverter channels were connected to the top ridge of the flame bucket. Upon reaching the diverter, water enters internal manifolds within the ridge. From there, it flows inside the hollow steel pipes that make up the diverter structure and is sprayed out through hundreds of small precision drilled holes across the surface. This high volume water flow is crucial for protecting the pad infrastructure by absorbing the extreme heat and suppressing the intense acoustic forces during engine ignition and liftoff. In the past week, teams have been trimming the ends of the diverter water pipes to level them, which seems to mark the final step in completing the diverter integration with the pad. We can expect several tests of the deluge system, including both the launch mount and the flame diverter, in the coming days. These tests will ensure the systems function as intended and are fully operational ahead of the upcoming launches. Interestingly, a few days ago, at the production site, a scrapped stainless steel ring section drew attention for its potential insights into Starship's orbital refueling architecture. This ring featured two ports flanking the quick disconnect panel, which are believed to serve as the propellant transfer interfaces during an orbit refueling operations. In the envisioned orbital refueling process, 
Two ships will dock in low Earth orbit, one acting as the tanker, which is pre-filled with propellants delivered by several other ships launched earlier, and the other as the recipient. Once docked, propellants will be transferred through these refueling ports using a pressure differential between the two vehicles. The transferred propellant replenishes the recipient starship's tanks, enabling it to undertake missions to destinations like the Moon, Mars, or deeper into space. SpaceX plans to conduct a propellant transfer demonstration in late 2025, a critical milestone for the Artemis program and future interplanetary missions. The recently observed ring section might be a Pathfinder unit, constructed to test and refine the design in preparation for this demonstration mission. Meanwhile, work continues to clear space for the construction of the Gigabay. The demolition of the High Bay is well underway, with the top half already removed, and work continues to dismantle the structure completely. Meanwhile, the wedge-shaped extension of the Star Factory was fully demolished on Saturday night, making room for upcoming developments. I've covered the Gigabay project in detail in a previous video. Be sure to check it out in the description for an in-depth breakdown. In a thrilling development, the FAA on May 6 approved a significant increase in the Starship launch rate from SpaceX's Starbase facility, following months of detailed environmental review. The new license permits up to 25 Starship launches and 50 combined booster and ship landings per year, a major leap from previous limits. Crucially, authorized landing zones now extend beyond Starbase, including the Gulf of Mexico, the Indian Ocean, the North Pacific near Hawaii, and the Southeast Pacific, enabling broader support for contingency and recovery operations. This decision follows a comprehensive, multi-month environmental assessment of Starship's expanded operations. The FAA analyzed a wide range of potential environmental impacts and evaluated the mitigation measures implemented by SpaceX to address those risks. The final outcome was a mitigated finding of no significant impact, an official determination that the increased launch and landing activity would not result in major environmental harm. Notably, the FAA's approval also includes launches from Pad B, indicating that the environmental review for this additional launch infrastructure is complete and meets regulatory standards. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. NASA is steadily progressing with preparations for the upcoming Artemis II mission to the Moon. Scheduled for February 2026, the mission will send four astronauts on a 10-day flyby around the Moon, marking the first crewed lunar mission since Apollo 17 in December 1972. Recent progress at NASA has bolstered confidence in the mission's timeline. In late April, Technicians in the Vehicle Assembly Building stacked the interim cryogenic propulsion stage atop the SLS core stage, marking a major milestone in the rocket's assembly process. Powered by a single RL-10 engine, this upper stage provides the critical translunar injection burn that sends the Orion spacecraft out of Earth orbit and onto its trajectory toward the Moon. Meanwhile, NASA carried out a key hardware replacement on the core stage. One of the four RS-25 engines, originally salvaged from the Space Shuttle era, was recently replaced due to a hydraulic leak in the oxidizer valve actuator. This actuator controls the flow of liquid oxygen into the engine's main combustion chamber. Swapping it out ensures better reliability and removes concerns about aging components inherited from earlier programs. Another key milestone came on May 1st when Lockheed Martin, the primary contractor for Orion, officially handed over the Artemis II spacecraft fully assembled and thoroughly tested, to NASA. Orion was subsequently transferred to the multi-payload processing facility at Kennedy Space Center, where it is currently undergoing propellant loading and final system verifications. Once fueling is complete, the spacecraft will be integrated with its launch abort system and mated to the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, completing the full-stack assembly. Following this, the SLS will enter its final pre-launch phase including a rollout to launch pad 39B for a full wet dress rehearsal to validate the rocket systems and conduct the countdown rehearsal ahead of the historic crude mission beyond low Earth orbit. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.